Hello, this is the next chapter in Lillian Gask's The Quest of the White Nile. Chapter the 13th, The Adjutant's Dinner. The scorching heat of India before the rains was very different from the moisture-laden warmth of the beautiful islands in the Malay archipelago that Conrad had left so far behind him in his long flight. He was curled up now by the shore of a lake, where he had dropped exhausted the night before, and Gladheart had much ado to wake him. Such birds, he twittered eagerly, they set the fire sky on fire. Don't you want to see them? I'd rather go to sleep again, said Conrad, opening one eye. But he had sat up in a great hurry, for the sky was filled with thousands of rose-red wings, and the honking cry of the flying birds sounded like a challenge. They are flamingos, and we are in one of their breeding places, Gladheart murmured. I hope they won't think we intend to harm them. They're powerful creatures. Conrad looked about him as they approached, flying in a long V-shape as geese do, with heads and necks outstretched, their vivid plumage a line of flame. There was no way of escaping them, even if he had thought to do so. The hundreds more were feeding in the lakes, their heads quite buried beneath the water, and their bills making a sort of spattering sound as they separated small fish and insects from weeds and mud, just as the ducks did in the ponds at home. As Conrad stood up, the flamingos posted as sentries honked warningly, and then walked rapidly away, looking over their shoulders. The birds who were feeding straightened their long necks with one accord, cackling like angry geese. That a stranger should trespass on their breeding ground was an unthought-of event. The flaming cloud of wings above surged towards the ground, and Conrad was rapidly surrounded. One particularly fine bird detached himself slightly from his comrades, and with a judicial air inquired who he was and whence he came. To answer his numerous questions, with so many eyes fixed on him in suspicion, was a trying ordeal for Conrad, and he was thankful when it was over. With a great clattering of their heavy mandibles, the flamingos no longer interested moved away. All but their leader, the Raja Rosian, who seemed inclined to talk. If you care to look around our village now that you are here, he said, carefully drawing up one long leg and hugging it close to his body, we shall not prevent you, but you must not expect a welcome. Our eggs are on the point of hatching, and our attention is of a much distracted. The hens have no eyes even for us just now. It is an anxious time. He spoke as if weighed down with care, and Conrad trod very gingerly when he had crossed one of the shallower lakes and reached a large mud island in the centre. This was a mass of low nests, round, plate-like heaps of mud, raised a few inches from the ground and with a slight depression in the centre. Some of the nests were joined together, others were separate, but on each a mother bird was sitting with her straggling legs folded neatly beneath her, and her graceful neck laid over her back, so that her pensive eyes were fixed on her tail. At the Raja's request, one moved a little, and Conrad was allowed a glimpse of her precious egg. It was covered with a chalky substance of dingy white, but here and there he could see the delicate green of its original colour. The time has come, she told the Raja tremulously. In a very few moments now it will be out. The other mothers were equally agitated, and Conrad felt that he ought to retire. But the Raja asked him to stay, for Conrad had won his heart by the respect with which he listened to him. Try standing on one leg, he said. It's much more comfortable. I'm glad you came. Ours is a noble family. Conrad seemed somehow to have heard this said before. And you might do worse than learn some facts about us. Conrad expressed himself as only too glad to improve his mind in this way, and with a mixture of pride and sadness the Raja began by reminding him that flamingos were well known to the ancients. 
The Romans thought a dish of our tongues worthy of the royal table, he added. I am not surprised at this, though I deplore it, for our tongues are quite peculiar to ourselves. They are not muscular, as most tongues are, but composed of a soft substance full of cells, and a large quantity of the finest fat. Their curved spines all point backward, as you may see, and they are very thick. Uh, yes, uh, we are uh, wonderfully made. Our mandibles are furnished with tooth-like saws. When our jaws are closed together, these form a filter, so that the water we take in with the little creatures, and on which we feed, may be drained away when we shake our bills. Uh, we belong to the Goose tribe, and... But a tumult of sound from the nests made him stop abruptly. The time had come for the breaking of many shells, and the rose-red bird, who is his own particular property, was thrilling with joy over her new-born son, as the funny little long-legged youngster shook himself free from the broken eggshell, and staggered to his feet. His beak was quite straight, unlike most of those of his parents, which were curved sharply in. In a few hours, said the Raja, gracefully scratching the back of his head with his foot, our young ones will take to the water as readily as we do, and their mothers will have enough to do to keep them in order. We nest in colonies, as you may have heard, and each colony, or village, has its sentinels, who give its inhabitants timely warning of the approach of strangers. If the young ones of one village wander into another, they are gently pecked and then sent home again by the elder birds of that colony, who keep their children to themselves. There is trouble, too, if young flamingos are not back in the nests at the proper time. We have to be very strict with them, or they would soon get beyond control. Conrad looked with covert sympathy at a newborn flamingo, who was already being corrected by his mother's beak. The Raja observed him, and an uneasy expression flashed in his dark, fine eyes. No, what are your plans? he asked benignly. It was his way of dismissing a guest who had outstayed his welcome, and Conrad knew it. I'm going to look for the white merle now, he said, spreading his wings at once, and his course was followed by a flying line of flamingos until he had passed beyond the village. The heat of the sun was almost overpowering, and when at last he came in sight of a wide belt of banyan trees, he made up his mind to rest. As he sank down slowly in the mists of their cool green shade, he found that on the highest branches were many nests made of small sticks lightly placed together. Downy young woodstalks were sitting in these, on the watch for their parents, who, for the second time that sultry day, had gone down to the river, some distance off, to fish for themselves, and for them. For they were very tame, and took little notice of Conrad questioning one another freely as to whether shellfish or eels were likely to be their portion that evening. The arrival of the older birds caused great excitement, and Conrad was amazed to see the amount of fish they had generously provided for their gawky nestlings. He fell asleep while the young storks were still discussing the possibility of eels tomorrow. And when the parent birds started at early dawn on another fishing expedition, he was quite ready to go with them part of the way. The foremost woodstalk, of venerable appearance, inquired most kindly as to the reason of his pilgrimage, and gave him many interesting particulars about his flock. Sometimes they call us woods abysses, he said. And though we are much more like storks than ibishes, we are supposed to be conne the connecting link between these, these birds. Another name which we are known 
by is shell stalks. This was given to us because we are particularly fond of shellfish and crack them easily in the curious gap in our open bills. The bills of our nestlings are perfectly straight, but these improve as they grow older. Until then we find their food for them. A trouble? Oh, no, no, it's a great joy. They are dear to our hearts, these little nestlings, and we love to tend them. I have often heard about storks, said Conrad. They were flying extremely high in the air, and a delicious breeze was playing around him. When I was a little chap, he went on thoughtfully, I always believed that storks brought babies. I used to wish I lived in Holland, so that I might see how they carried them over the tulip beds. Mm. said the wood stalk rather uneasily with a look at some of the younger birds. I can tell you a quite true stork story, if you'd like to hear it. Yes, well, here it is. That little Holland you spoke of is a curious place. A cousin told me, for it lies, as it were, in the hollow of the sea, and many of its streets are waterways. The storks build their nests on the roofs of the houses, as they do, indeed in many other parts of the world. Wherever they go, they are made welcome, and are looked upon as friends. The storks bring good luck, as you know, as well as babies. Some hundreds of years ago, just at the time when their nestlings, though some weeks old, were not yet strong enough to fly, there was a terrible fire in one of the Dutch cities. It spread until nearly all the buildings were in flames. As the smoke rose higher, and higher, and tongues of fire licked the hot wood and set it crackling. The storks were seen trying to carry their little ones to a place of safety. But the nestlings, alas, were too heavy, and try as they might, the parent birds could not lift them. At last, after many struggles, they gave up the attempt. There was still time for them to escape themselves, but they would not desert their young. So they gathered them under their wings as if to protect them to the very last, and met their death in this way. That was splendid, cried Conrad, with a light in his eyes, and the woodstalk looked at him very kindly. I could tell you other stories too, he said, though I'm not so sure about these being true. The storks, as you doubtless know, are found in many different countries, and uh, their summer quarters are often far away from our winter ones. We are great travellers. In Morocco, though, through which some of us pass in our migration to Europe at the beginning of the year, while others remain there to breed, the natives believe that we are directly sent by Allah to assist them in destroying the poisonous insects and deadly snakes that infest their land. In return for our services, they take us under their protection and call us sacred birds. Can you kill snakes? Real big ones? cried Conrad, looking at him with awe. Uh, real big ones, uh, serpents, replied the woodstalk with relish. You should see the adjutant. He's a great hand at it. There's one of his breeding grounds below us. Can't you hear his cry? He is silent except at this season, when his feelings get the better of him. Conrad listened. He could hear nothing but what he supposed to be the lowing of many cows. That's his love song, said the woodstalk. He's my own first cousin, and we make a point of standing by our kindred. But I must allow that I don't admire his way of expressing himself. If you'll excuse me, 
Conrad remarked. I'll go and see what he is like. And waving farewell to the friendly woodstalks, he drooped his wings and slowly descended. The lofty trees amongst which he dropped were crowded towards their tops with big untidy nests, where frizing young adjutants nestled besides their mothers. Their fathers stood, or sat, on the sun-baked ground beneath them, in the queerest attitudes. Some almost touched their toes with their wide beaks, their wings sticking straight out from their bodies like distorted railway signals that had been painted a dull grey. Others were throned upon the earth, with their legs tucked under them, and yawned so wild, widely that Conrad quite understood why Gladheart hid himself amongst his feathers. The naked and pendulous pouches which hung from their throats were anything but lovely. Their heads and necks were bare, save for a scanty supply of down. The prevailing colour of their plumage was a dingy grey, but under their stiff tail co coverts were beautiful feathery plumes of white, finer than the finest silk. The marabou feathers that adjutants share with their cousins in Africa, the marabou stalks. One great fellow raised himself as he caught sight of Conrad. His manner was distinctly threatening as he walked, stalked up to him. I am Agala, he cried. And you are? Conrad? Don't say anything about me, entreated Gladheart. Sorry. Don't say anything about me, entreated Gladheart. I don't like the look of his bill. Your errand, proceeded the adjutant. A friendly one, said Conrad, and Argala's air became more gentle. So long as you don't disturb our young ones, we shall make no objection to your presence, he said. You have much the look of a man-child, in spite of your pointed wings, and we are friends with man. When we live in his haunts, we clear his streets for him, and swallow the refuse that he throws out. How do you earn your living? I haven't begun yet, Conrad told him mildly. Just now I'm looking for the white myrtle. I suppose that you don't happen to have seen her. Argala clamped, clamped his great jaws wearily. What should I want with a white merle? he said. My mate is good enough for me. She has a lovely voice. Well, so have we. Didn't you hear us just now? Yes, said Conrad, adding hastily. The woodstalk said that you killed snakes. Argala nodded gravely and threw, threw himself into another grotesque attitude. When the floods come, he said, we follow the course of the rising waters and eat the reptiles, which, driven from their holes, would otherwise prey on the helpless natives. There's nothing I am more partial to than a snake for dinner. There's one behind you now. Conrad turned quickly, half doubting the adjutant's words. But gliding towards him, fold by fold, was a slippery, slimy serpent that hunger had roused from sleep. As this stealthily uncoiling itself from the trunk of a spreading tree, Conrad could not move. He felt as though he were turned into stone under the horrible green eyes that held his own. Nearer and nearer the creature came. Gladheart gave a despairing gasp, and the adjutant stalk who had drawn back into the shadows of a bush made a sudden dart. With a smashing blow from his great bill, he knocked the snake over as it prepared to spring, banging into its heavy body from side to side. as if it were a featherweight. Having battered it to death, he calmly proceeded to swallow it whole, or at least as much of it as he could manage. Forgetting his wings, Conrad took to his heels and ran. It was most ungrateful, and not very brave, but Gladheart agreed with him afterwards that an adjutant eating his dinner is scarcely a pleasing sight.